This summer, I walked away from films. I didn't want to see another damn movie so long as I lived. I headed for the hills, for salt water and forests and books and anything but a damn movie. I was tired of it. Tired of the ads and posters and the same old plots, and the same old cuts, and the same old actors. Most of all, I was tired of knowing everything they had to say. Pauline Kael said, other arts show an internal logic in their development, the constant solving of aesthetic challenges. Films have changed simply by following the logic of the market. Or as paraphrased by Andrei Tarkovsky, the cinema, she is a whore. Then again, in a tough world, sometimes being a whore is the only way to survive. Take the summer of 2014. The box office collapsed. I wasn't the only one avoiding the cinema. No one went to see any of the superhero dreck except Guardians of the Galaxy. Why? Because the rabble is bored. We'll now have the spectacle of financially imploding studios grasping for life preservers as the wreckage sinks beneath their feet. Maybe in the ensuing chaos, there will be a few more chances taken on ideas, not budgets. And film, this beautiful shitty art, will have a little room to stretch its legs. The problem as a market-driven art has always been us. We, the audience, are the other half of her equation and we have shitty taste. We forced her to live in the shadows like a guerrilla fighter, picking her battles carefully, but despite our best efforts, she's still got fight in her, a lot, and she's tired of our bullshit. While Hollywood showers us in a shitstorm of pizzazz, filmmakers like Steve McQueen and Nicholas Reffin and Gaspar Noé and P.T. Anderson have taken a long step back from the audience and hoisted a middle finger, retreating into a stark and stubborn minimalism that demands you get off your ass and meet it halfway. Their toolkit is less, not more. In an age where you can sit in the multiplex and hear Transformers hammering the tourist traps three theaters away, these cats have decided to shut their mouths, cross their arms, and use silence as a weapon. The static camera and the long take are their defenses. They will beat you in a staring contest. Now take under the skin, Jonathan Glazer's polarizing alien visitor yarn. On the surface, it's a smooth, facile piece of work without much plot, and owes too much to Stanley Kubrick's visual obsessions without mirroring his provocateur's instincts. But hold on, wait 24 hours. You might be washing dishes or walking to the car when you find yourself replaying images from the film. You might hear its sounds and remember its moods, its moments. Because this film, as much as any I've seen in the past year, is a living thing to itself. Crafted and sculpted and cared for and reared by its director as only a loving parent could. Here is a film that wants to be alive and possess a singular identity. And if it mimics the behaviors of those films which are kindred spirits, so too children mimic their peers. Glazer has, with all his might, tried to make a film which is a vehicle of transformation. To analyze further is to make a physiological catalog of the parts of a horse without loving the beauty of the beast at full gallop. But at the risk of doing so, I'll point out two things Glazer has accomplished. First, he's removed nearly all plot. On first viewing of the film, it's what bothered me most, that nothing really happens. Scarlett Johansson's alien visitor wanders around Scotland, enticing lone men into her van, taking them to meet a horrible fate, but finally develops some sort of conscience and meets her own kind of fate. You can read more about the story online, or read Michael Faber's book of the same name, which I haven't, but I think this will only devalue your experience of watching the film. To discuss it in the usual language of plot points, etc., or to think of it as some familiar parable, in short, to explain it, is trivializing. The second thing Glazer has done is shoot in a persistently observant style, at times from cameras hidden in public, and of course the famous scenes of Scarlett Johansson interacting with non-actors who approach her van in order to offer help. This observant approach does two things. One is to suggest the alien point of view, free of judgment, and the second is to eventually seduce us over to this point of view and offer us the chance to judge for ourselves. I'm thinking here of the scene where two parents drown trying to save their dog and each other, leaving their infant wailing confusedly on the rocky beach. There may be no more horrifying and dazzling image I've seen in the last year of films. Another is the recurrent image of Min, the victims of the alien, who follow her home like flies to the spider in her inky black web. They disrobe as she disrobes. They follow her into a polished black space and are slowly swallowed by the floor. The sight of the men, naked, vulnerable, following their erections to their doom, is open to interpretation. For me, it neatly dismisses the ubiquitous conceit of the modern male as a shaved and perfumed caveman tossing spears at mammoths, aliens and giant robots, then rounding off his campfire victory dance with some tribally sanctioned baby-making. The narcissism and slavery to his own libido is shown to be not the source of the triumphant male's might, but his most exploitable weakness. 
In moments like this, and in composing the film to be taken as a whole, Glazer has tapped one of film's inexhaustible wells, its potential for empathy. Empathy not for the usual stock characters overcoming tired odds to get that big promotion, secure a lover, or blow up the bridge, but empathy for anything that is alive and by living experiences vulnerability. Individual forms and faces are sketched vaguely into Glazer's scenes like muddy figures in a landscape by Bruegel or Bosch, but the very distance from them, the obsession with watching, indeed our curiosity as an impulse, is what leads us eventually to want to put an arm around them and talk. In a pointed reversal, our sympathy for the alien's potential victims opens us up to her own victimization when it comes upon her. Scenes or intimations of rape have somehow become a casual plot device and source of titillation even in mainstream films, to the effect that our senses have become as dull to them as to the cartoonish gore of torture porn or the post-9-11 disaster porn of our blockbusters. Yet Under the Skin had, by its final moments, so reminded me of what it means to be human that I could feel only the fear and nausea of the pursued trying to outrun the pursuer. I knew what it meant to be seen as something to be used rather than as a person. I am, for one, in love with film again. Movies like Under the Skin remind me that abstraction, simple and odd combinations of image and sound, are enough to build an impression and even make a great film. Film is alive and well, and it's coming for us, all of us, and she still has a lot of tricks up her sleeve. Well, thank you very much, William. You're welcome, sir. I got to say, that was, I am, I am, uh, I am not comfortable in the saddle again. That was a tough review to write. Wow, oh, yeah. Today, uh, I, I wrote uh, a review for our next episode, and it was, it, you know, it dawned upon me how it really takes like two or three times to really get going now, you know, because we used to do the show every two weeks, you know, like 365 days a year. And, you know, you kind of, you know, you're in a rhythm, you're in a rhythm. And now, you know, we take a long uh, time off and some of us aren't on every show. And uh, it's really difficult, right? You know, it, to, it is. It's I'm, I'm rusty. I ain't going to lie. Get, but it was. But that. But yeah, it was, it was an good. awesome <laughs> review, though. <laughs> like that was an A review, whereas mine's going to be a D review. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but, but seriously. Uh, well, first of all, guys, I want to welcome everybody back. You know, it's season four. We've come a long way. It's great to have everyone uh, at the at the table here. Uh, I hope you all had a great summer. I'm really excited about talking to you guys about this film and the and the two classic films we're going to be doing next week. We're going to be talking about The Man Who Fell to Earth and The Brother from Another Planet. Uh, we're obviously starting with this one. And, Billy, this film gave me the same kind of excitement it gave you. As I, oh, that's great to as, hear, as, Tom. As I, I get chills just even thinking about it. That's uh, awesome, dude. You know, it's funny uh, that you talk about plotless filmmaking, Bill, because Joe and I had a little discussion did we not joe uh, uh over yeah. the summer about <laughs> link ladders boy the other the other uh savior savior of a film that came out over the yeah, summer it's so funny how, or this year early part how of a couple year. of plotless films really got me excited this summer and that was revisiting slacker by richard link ladder mm -hmm. and now doing this jonathan glazer movie under the skin there's so, you know there's something uh going on here with filmmakers that that deal with plotless cinema, because mm. there's so, I don't know what it is, but there's so much room to give the viewer so much more. It's amazing. And I'm, I'm not quite sure why. I mean, uh, maybe you guys could shed a little light on it, but it's. I think, Bill, I mean, Bill, you kind of touched upon it in your review. It's just that you get tired. I mean, you just get worn out and tired of the same old formula well, the, coming at you. This is like the oldest, the oldest argument in cinema has always been between cinema and the other art forms, primarily theater. And the idea got sort of uh, schlepped into American filmmaking early on that it was an industry and it's an entertainment and it needs to make money. So they basically just uh, borrowed uh, piecemeal, you know, theatrical tradition. So plot and actor and, you know, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, you know, and all of these plot mm -hmm. things basically mm -hmm. got shoved into it. So on the one hand, you get the school of filmmaking that's just that. I, I guess it's it's like a traditional argument. There's that and then there's what people imagine to be this concept of pure filmmaking, which is all you need is image and sound. Dialogue is yeah. part of sound. Music is part of sound. Sound effects are part of sound. And image and can be anything. From, and you build up. And you there. build impressions out of that, you know. And very early on, I mean, as early as the 1910s and 1920s, there were especially French filmmakers uh, and German filmmakers doing these abstract films that were just images 
and impressions, you know, and uh, in America, it's just, you know, traditionally been very tough to to make that kind of movie because we think of it as entertainment. I mean, you go online and look at the reviews, the negative reviews for Under the Skin, whether it's Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb or whatever, and there's just this vitriol pointed at what the hell was that about? There's That's no sad. plot. That's there's so no sad. plot. There's nothing. And I'm like, well, you know, I get that, but who says you need a plot in a movie? Well, it's, it, yeah. it's a lot harder work to, uh, you know, for, for the average person to, like, get it when they have, you know, when they don't have something to hang hang their thoughts on. Yeah. You know, well, when they have to, like, there's search for com- it. There's a, right. Yeah, there's nothing comforting there. The, you know, there's nothing to set you at ease there. You know what I mean? Right, right. And that's what we all need to, I mean, that's a shame that instead of exploring ourselves in these experiences of, of cinema, we, Joe, we're going after comfort. Well, Je- yeah, absolutely, Tom. I, you know, well, I, you know, I have so many ideas coming into my head just on what you guys are talking about. But I'm just curious to hear what Jeff's general reaction oh, to the sure. film was. Was it positive or negative? Oh, I, I loved it. Oh, right. oh I mean, actually, I, See, yeah. I wish that. Well, I, I, uh, actually, this goes back to uh, Tom's library comment. Um, I had tried to go to my library, which is I would not recommend to anyone. To go to your, this, your library or the library in general, my li- the, the Neptune Public Library. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, like I kept, I looked online on the online catalog, and I was like, "Oh yeah, cool." Under the skins, there, I'll go pick it up and watch it Wednesday or Thursday or whenever. It was gone. It was out. Um, but uh, so I didn't actually, I didn't actually get to watch it until this afternoon. Which oh. you know, wow. I mean, I'm a, glad that that's I, a fresh perspective. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, I'm glad that I, that it it came today because otherwise, you know, I'd be pulling a, uh, well, that's a interesting. But... You know, that's interesting. Jeff. I'm glad that you did get to see it. But, um, as Billy mentioned in his review and I had a very similar, uh, response and I don't know, Tom, if you did as well, but I was just thinking it took me like a few days for this thing to sink no, in. You, you know I, you what know, I mean? It's so like, funny. Billy said that, uh, also that it took him 24 hours. Now it happened with me with the brother from another planet where things started to sink in a little bit, but this film, you, you know, Joe, I, I was really immersed in it immediately. And oh. I was really surprised. And a lot of it had to do with the score, Billy, for some reason. That is one of the great scores of the last decade. Absolutely. Like it's, it, the, and he found that, yeah, it's amazing. There's no doubt about it. Who's that? Mika? Mika Levy or wrote? something. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's astounding. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hypnotizing. Yeah, I will also say this. I wonder if it's easier to watch this film uh, in the comfort of your own home where you feel safe because I saw it in the theater and it had wow. an almost overwhelming negative response from everybody. And even almost for me, like when it ended, I was just like, I have no idea what to think about that film, <laughs> you know, great. and for you guys to I have like, a, and I love that, that you, sometimes there's like this, there's like this uh, sort of high wire uh, period where you walk out of a movie like that and you're like, I don't know which way I'm going to fall on this. And then over the next 24 hours, like sometimes you just realize, God, that was a piece of shit. Right. Like, or and then, are you just for <laughs> another? Yeah. yeah. And then you just like, yeah. And then this one, all of a sudden, most times you're right, Tom, you do almost always just forget about right. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? but, but then you get like when I, when we were walking out of the theater there, it was like an art house theater or whatever. And, um, most of the people I just heard negative responses like that was fucking what was that supposed to, like you know what was that like David Lynch like and whenever anybody can't understand something for, in a movie it's always it's David Lynch, Lynch. <laughs> it's always David but it, Lynch. it'd be interesting kind of, to hear what those people are saying you know the next day when they have yeah well and that's the thing man it. I mean you walk out of that theater and you're like all right I'm gonna suspend judgment here for a second because I don't it it, it just took it takes a while for it to to wrap itself around and it wasn't until like the next day two days i was just walking i'm like oh it just dawned on me i was like oh you know a lot of the stuff that billy was talking about about how um you know these ideas were starting to come into my head like oh human uh, empathy is a you know a profoundly human quality and that is a, a weakness it, it's a weakness i mean which is you know sort of the inroad to what the what the film is trying to say and it doesn't didn't even occur to me until like after because when you're first watching it you're trying to make sense of what's happening what it, where it's going again it's no, there's no plot so you're not sure why or what you you're know you're just not and, sure how to respond because you're ner- like neurologically you're conditioned by so many movies that you there's times where you're just reacting according to how you're supposed to react 
right? Like they tell, you know, in movies, there's the formulas are so boiled down that oftentimes, like, I find myself sort of waking up out of a stupor when I'm in the middle of a movie that's sort of mediocre and I'm laughing at things and whatever, but I'm laughing at it because that's the time at which I'm supposed to laugh, you know? Right. And yeah. all of a sudden this movie comes in and it doesn't, it, it doesn't feed you the easy formula for how to respond to a particular situation. You know, like that scene on the beach, I was almost bored with when I was uh, in the theater, you know, and it wasn't until like later that I'm thinking about it. And I'm just like, God, that's like, it's, it lingered, you know, the image of that baby sitting on the beach lingered and it, you know, it's more disturbing residing in your thoughts <laughs> than when you're actually watching the movie. Right. You know? That that scene affected me immediately, uh, but it has lingered. It's it's weird that some would would have a, an immediate reaction to that, and and to others it might happen. A, a- yeah. Well, here's another here's another little anecdote from the screening that I was at. It's again, it was this art house movie theater, so like they have like a bulletin board on the in the lobby or whatever, and it has like your comments that you write after the movie's over or whatever <laughs> and and Susie and my wife and I were walking in I was like listen I, I don't want to look at that board I'm, we're not looking at the board you know we just walk past, past the board and then on the way out of course I'm hearing all these comments or whatever and then we stopped by the board and one of the comments was like I I don't understand why that bit that baby in the scene was just completely unnecessary yeah. and it shouldn't have been in there yeah. and uh, like uh, you know and again I just reserved judgment on it and it wasn't until like hours and days later that i was like oh that scene is completely necessary, necessary to- <laughs> but the, here's the thing though like is it really fair to like immediately critique a film after watching like immediately you know i mean think about all these people that do this for a living where they're you know probably sitting in the theater with like a, a laptop or some kind of a device taking notes and then they walk out of the theater and they go to their homes or their hotel rooms or wherever they may go and they just start writing a review i have done this show for two years now and if there's anything that i've learned is you can't write about a film uh, the minute you stop watching a movie i mean in my opinion i completely agree man it's, uh, it's occurred to you me so many times sleep, at least at least especially just like what billy was saying like you're like to write these reviews the way that we've come to write them and not that it's necessary. We even, you know, the rule on the show is do whatever the fuck you want. Intro. All you have to do is just talk about the movie as an introduction. It could be just talking about it or whatever, but it, the way that it's kind of evolved, Tom, is that, you know, we put a lot of thought and energy and heart into these things. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's occurred to me a lot. Like, how could you just watch a movie like, like this movie or a, a lot of any movie, right. you know what I mean? Right. And, and just pump out review after review right. it's almost foreign yeah. to me, and it's you know? unfair to really talk about any film in- intelligently with just one viewing of it to be honest yeah. if you really think well, about I'll it t- i mean we're, we're just talking uh, we're not even talking about the little intricacies of this film we're talking about how people perceive seeing films like this well you know? here's what here's the other which thing is a good start a- yeah, well, here's a th- here's another thing that Billy was talking about is that you know, uh, bu- like the market driving the art form, right? Well, we're talking we're people who crit- are critiquing movies are critiquing them or talking about them like product, like consumer. What's that? Consumer uh, affairs or what? No, what is it? What's that? Consumer, consumer reports. Uh, there he goes. Consumer reports, consumer you know, affairs. like they're like they're talking about it like, oh, well, that chair has a sturdy leg, but, you know, the the shine wears off. It. You know what I mean? So the biggest like, problem di- I have with reviewing these movies is after every movie I see that I like, my only review that I can think of is one sentence. I liked it. Go see it. That's it. <laughs> right. But that's crazy. And, that, and then if there's a bad movie, my like I can instantly come up with 50, you know, paragraphs to to shit on the movie. But I don't want to do that either. You know, yeah. so, that's why the thumbs up, thumbs down uh, way of doing things might be the most brilliant, <laughs> brilliant of them. All. <laughs> you know? So, Jeff, after seeing it just a couple of hours ago, I mean, what's like what's happening? Did did this stuff all like kind of you're you're reacting to some of these themes that we're talking about already or yeah like yeah i mean i i i knew that i was only going to have an, an hour or so i guess like an hour really uh between watching it so i was like really kind of like trying to 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 piece it together as it was going which you know was i you know i i probably would have benefited just to kind of let it happen and then you know have a day 
or two to like think about it. But I mean, you know, that's the the way it goes sometimes. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it was like w- what he was trying to say was very like powerful to me, and 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 you know, like like a scene like that, the the family and the the dog and baby, uh, like that scene, you know. It uh, like I could see, you know, someone judging that scene immediately and saying that's unnecessary. But once you uh, get to like the you know the, the the last third of the movie, it really starts to make sense. You know, it's like the yeah. first human uh, f- like feeling that she has. It's like seeing right. it in hindsight, kind of. Uh... It, it everything sort sort of gels together after you realize mm. you know what's happened what's yeah. what she's gone through right you know you understand the the importance of stuff like you know she falls down and somebody helps her up like that's not you know that's not a movie scene you know that's yeah. that's a uh, that's just an occurrence that's you know, almost that's like a almost, painting you know like it's just yeah. it's just a moment that has nothing to do with drama or anything but the the you know we were talking about plot a minute ago i think every movie does need a plot it's just that the plot need not be necessarily visible to you in the way that you're accustomed to seeing and it need not be about the things you're accustomed to seeing plots as right so that is a dramatic moment because she recognizes something about sympathy for the people or the the people have around her you know yeah good so that is a plot point, but you're just not used to seeing that as a plot point. Well, the plot, yeah, the plot well, is what happens better, to her. You're not used to having to figure out what the plot point is. Yeah, exactly. like what does that mean exactly. that I just saw? You know, like <laughs> right. you just, it's just, you know, that's exactly it. Was, what no, you no, have, no, it, no it, actors it, wink, like going wink, wink into the camera when something happens. Yeah. Yeah, or the music crescendoing, telling you how to feel about that, or, or any of those usual tricks that you know. Sure. Have yeah, you even like know. even like dialogue where she's like, "Oh, I I can't believe you," you know. You're kind that. enough to pick me up. <laughs> yeah, or like the you know on the, on the beach, like I can't. Well, after that guy wakes up from her knocking him out, you know, uh, like he she wasn't like, "Oh, I can't," you know, "I can't believe you tried to save that family." I I I don't I can't believe humans can be so good. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And then the camera lowers and the sky panorama fills out yeah. behind her and yeah. she turns in profile <laughs> and, nobly. And, yeah, and, and she, yeah, me, yeah, he's, like, yeah, he's on uh riding a bike and he's on the handlebar and she's on the handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> right. exactly. Or like I'll I'll let you go. You're one of the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh have you guys seen his other movies, Birth and uh, and Sexy Beast. One thing I'm ashamed of is ne- I, I've never screened Sexy Beast, and this is something that I've been, uh, you know, I've heard so much about over the years, and I, I, for the life of me, I can't figure out why I haven't haven't screened it. Billy, you did uh, mention Birth the, the other day in a message, uh, but no, I have not. I've not watched either one of those films. Uh, yeah, I've either. seen them both. You guys, Joe, you saw Sexy Beast, right? I, yeah, I have. That's the one with um, Ben uh, Kingsley. Geez, ben Kingsley. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. That was a great film. I have a weird, a weird reaction to Birth, but I, I want to hear what you have to say about it before I, uh, before I tell you. It's more anecdotal my reaction to Birth than anything <laughs> okay. else. Yeah. I, I just thought that uh, I saw it in the theater when it came out. And I had a uh, sort of a middling reaction to it. I really enjoyed a lot of it, but I didn't really, you know, it didn't. It created kind of a lasting impression, but not a great impression. And then I yeah. saw it again last week, and I loved it. I mean, mm. up until probably the last third, uh, I loved it. I, I thought that it sort of felt collapsed under its own weight, partly because he tried to resolve things with a plot point, like a plot twist kind of a thing. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and so I th- I th- think in a way he almost learned his lesson on that and said you know if I, I'm going to commit myself to this to this more avant garde abstract way of filmmaking then I better take it all the way and not sort of chicken out at the end you know so yeah. I love well, the filmmaking I, of Birth I think it's it's in a weird way it's a companion piece to Eyes Wide Shut because both mm. have Nicole Kidman both are in New York and yes. both are filmed in this uh, it, you know obviously Jonathan Glazer is is tracing retracing kubrick's footsteps and trying to get out where he ended and then get out in front of him even further i was gonna say this is the second time that you've mentioned glazer and uh, kubrick in the same sentence uh so far 
Don't yeah. you? I mean, do you guys see he the loved, similarities in their? Yeah, he seems to love two thousand one. <laughs> there's that like blue, that tone, yeah, the, yeah. Like there's that blue light in the beginning, yeah. And then uh, I th- there's even like the soundtrack sounds like the monolith, uh, you know. Uh, on the um, on the interview track of uh, of uh, Under the Skin, he actually cited that monolith sound and oh, yeah. saying that you know he's like he's like that was part of the attraction for for me for that film because. I didn't know. I never knew what it meant, mm-hmm. and that was that was you know you're you're left to put to to ask yourself what it so, what it might mean. Joe, you know, what so. was your uh, anecdotal uh, reaction? So yeah, I mean, I love the the um, atmosphere of birth. I thought it was really beautiful, um, and I think that you're right about the convention thing because actually, also on that interview track of Under the Skin, he mentions that the first draft of this of this film, Under the Skin, was very conventional you know mm-hmm. and closer to the novel he said it was very good but they couldn't get funding for it and actually it was a blessing in disguise but the thing is i watched birth probably right when it came out and i didn't remember it like at all you know and then i watched it maybe last year and i'm watching this movie and i'm like i don't know i know what's gonna happen <laughs> like i completely forgot i had watched the film you know yeah. and the whole time i'm like i know exactly what's gonna happen with this film this fucking film sucks you know <laughs> and then it wasn't only it was only like maybe three quarters of the way through i was like oh shit i've seen this film before <laughs> so like it was a really weird uh situation because it's so reliant on you know the reveal at the end you know uh-huh. and i completely knew it and it felt like i knew it because the the filmmaking was obvious which wasn't the case i had just friggin watched it but it, it was just a very odd uh, i feel like odd jonathan glazer watching. worked in commercials and music videos uh since the late 80s early 90s and you know i i swear to god music videos and commercials have done more to fuck film over than anything else in its history because these guys like uh, David Fincher has worked his entire career to divorce himself of the conventions of commercial and, and music video making. Yeah. And uh, I feel or, or like Spike guys, Jones. Yeah. yeah. All of them, man, yeah. you know, and in all of them, there's moments in their movies where you look at it and you go, you know, like uh, what's his name? Romanek, uh, Michael Romanek, Mark Romanek, uh, who did uh, one hour photo with Robin Williams and all that. Like there's these m- movies that are, daring in one regard but they're so stuck in convention, convention. in other yeah. ways yeah, 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 yeah. that it's like i mean i see jonathan glazer just working his damnedest to get out of that mentality you know and i mean he did as well as he's ever done in in under the skin i think but you know it's still a sand trap i think one thing i do want to mention too bill uh there's something about watching a film that doesn't take place in america also that really that really draws me into it mm. uh, I, I i find that like you know when i'm watching these films in america they all it's like they all take place in new york chicago los angeles you know and you just kind of they all have that same feel to them basically but whenever i watch you know uh, a film from europe or asia or wherever i I'm immediately more into it for some reason, just because of the landscape, the towns, the cities just have a completely and entire everywhere except for Italy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, there's something about it. And I noticed that as well, watching this movie was that I kind of have, you know, I, I kind of get drawn into a film a, a little bit more that doesn't take place here in the United States. I, I, I think there's something to that. And in fact, uh, I think Joe and I talked about this a couple of years ago, but the, I've always wondered if, uh, or I had always wondered if, uh, if all those Ingmar Bergman movies would, would be a lot worse if they were spoken in English. And then I watched one of his movies that was written in English and the actor spoke English and it was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this well, is some pretentious <laughs> posturing bullshit. This is like, it's, no, it's, I know they, they all it's sp- a lot easier when I don't understand what the fuck they're saying. Well, it's funny because a lot of Ingmar Bergman stuff is like oh, God, stuff you might read in like a philosophy book or, or like a, um, like a Camus, a Camus book or something like that, you know? So when you're reading it in subtitles, it actually kind of works, you know? Yo, this, yeah, the, the, the subtitle writer can like 
fix stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> like make it a little yeah. more artful. Make it palatable. <laughs> well, you could get away with some of the literary trappings of, you know, yeah. wording and stuff like that easier uh, when you're reading it than if you're processing it by, you know, hearing it. And you've you know? got Max von Sydow's gigantic cranium filling your screen and he's looking all <laughs> angsty and there's the wind blowing on Faro in the background. And like when he says something like, I'm convinced that... Uh, we're a stain on the shoe of God. You're like, well, of course that's what he would say in that, you know, but if you say it in English, it just sounds ridiculous. Although, you know, we just talked about Linklater, Tom, and his stuff is very, uh, aside from boyhood and even in slacker, like a lot of that dialogue is very like written kind of dialogue, like, you know, pontification and all that stuff. And it kind of works, you know, the great thing about Linklater is when he, he has people sitting in cafeterias over orange soda, saying that stuff and it never feels too contrived because it feels like those characters would be sitting there right he's right yeah he's writing about those guys yeah Yeah. (laughs) uh billy you're right about uh glazer and kubrick i think because glazer seems to like to make a film every 10 years just like stanley kubrick (laughs) (laughs) well it took him 10 years to get this one man evidently you know and like i said he he was trying he was trying to sell um a more conventional plot and just didn't get the budget that he needed for it. So it was one of the many projects up... Brad Pitt was attached to originally. And, is that right? Yeah and, yeah. and then had to quit. He is attached to everything that dude. <laughs> he, he gets a lot of independent filmmakers hopes up and then just dashes yeah. them. So he was attached to meat cycle. Wasn't he Joe? <laughs> yeah, he actually was in my meat cycle. He's the one guy <laughs> behind the mask. <laughs> I had Brad Pitt on film and I was like, what does this need? I said, you know what? Let's cover his face. <laughs> well, guys, I know uh, it, it's been a long summer and everybody's wondering what we've all been up to and, and whatnot before we uh, end the show and talk a little cutting room, uh, business. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about under the skin? Jonathan Glazer, anything we've been discussing? Please throw it out there. I just wanted to say that I got. I brought this it's one. Billy, it's always I, it's always Joe. Sorry, <laughs> I just going to say it quick. I just want. I brought this out there because I thought that it would. You know, we'd get somebody have a, reacting against it. You know, so it it actually didn't work out the way that I planned. But you know, that's a good thing. We had a. I people's reaction to this are. Um, violently against it, a lot of people. Joe, so, the three um, people that were on the panel tonight. I know. You, now, listen, did you, th- like, if you had to pick one of us, who would you have thought would have disliked this movie? Uh, probably you, because I had talked to Billy about it briefly uh, the last time we got drunk together. <laughs> and, uh, he, you know, we, we talked about it for a couple minutes. I knew that he liked it. Uh, I don't really know Jeff's taste so well yet, so I was I was thinking it would be you, but I knew it would have been Max if he saw. I'm pretty sure, except Max would have, of course. What would Max be? Can you do Max talking about this film? Oh um, my no, God. <laughs> no, can you do the best Max impression. I don't do any Max impression. <laughs> Come on, you could do it. Do it. No. What, what would Max be saying about the film? About Scarlett Johansson's big, big luscious <laughs> boobies and and delicious ripe ass. Ooh, is that what when she is? eaten the cake i just i wish i was the frosting on that cake I, I, <laughs> she could gag, she could gag on on my cake any any day of the week that is my max cook impression ladies and gentlemen but hey listen speaking um, of max speaking of max cook joe him and uh, a former member of the cutting room movie podcast just got together to go on a little joy ride the video is up on youtube we'll put it uh uh, on our website with this with this episode, these two knuckleheads getting together on a hot Los Angeles day. What's what's up with that? Evidently, Max is very busy. Yeah. with all sorts of exactly, stuff. exactly. <laughs> he's, too, he's too busy to do anything. He's driving around with Jenna Payne. Uh, he, what were they doing? He went to a, fu- uh, a cemetery. They crashed a funeral, <laughs> a burial. I think. Uh, what, what else did they do? I don't even know what they were up to. I mean, it was. They went to a red box. It was very, red... it's very fascinating. They went to a red box. They went to a funeral. <laughs> and, then, and you, t- and you can text to... Matt Max Cook d- d- during any afternoon, and he's always telling me how busy he is. He's very busy. He's busy with Jenna riding around in the pain mobile and uh, watching well, Alice. She, brand- uh, Mel's Dino. she branded her car, Joe. Now, this is something you might want to think about doing. I am gonna I am gonna do that actually. I have done it already. I made it the pain. And Jeff, you should do that for your band. Whatever like do you do that? Actually, that's you know, that's something that I'm sure some 
bands might do. Oh, you, like uh, putting like a band logo or something or, or yeah. brand. You know well, what that says is, uh, "Hey, cops, we're a band. Search us for drugs." <laughs> Exactly. Why would you want to? Yeah. Why would you want to draw that attention to yourself when you're out on the highway? Uh, no sense. Well, guys, listen. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you for bringing under the skin to the table. Uh, completely fascinating, dude. Seriously, I had an awesome time. And like Billy, I swear, I really got excited. <laughs> I got excited for at least 24 hours about films. Oh, Billy, by the way, in your review, you wrote about how you wanted to stay away from films, and you kind of you kind of get sick of that same thing over and over again. I am with you 100% on that, dude. I kind of get like that, too, every once in a while. I, th- I, I think it's necessary, especially, like... I mean, we just have information overload these days anyway, right? Like, there's TV and internet and movies and everything. And, you know, part of the joy of watching this movie was the sense of uh, tactile sensation, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, when you see those rocks and you see that Scottish countryside and you hear the sounds of people and everything, you know, you spend a couple months away from media and you, you know, you feel real everything all the time and then you come back and see a beautiful movie like this you know the movie is only as good as the person who's coming to watch it so you know all i can say is you know turn off your televisions once in a while go for a nice long hike and then earn the right to watch a good movie you know absolutely well we hope that the comment boards uh light up a little bit here on on our youtube channel joe and also on our our uh, website the cutting room movie podcast.com The Cutting Room Movie Podcast is brought to you by Christiana Productions and New Media Limited. The show is edited and co-produced by Joseph Schreck and produced by Thomas Detloff and Joe Christiana. You can like us on Facebook at The Cutting Room Movie Podcast and follow me on Twitter, Thomas Detloff at TCRM Podcast. You can also check out Joe's film work at ChristianaProduction.com. Uh, you can check out Jeff's new Black Wine album. His band Black Wine just put out an album, Yell Boss, available on Don Giovanni Records. And they're also playing Friday, September 26th at Cooler Ranch in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and Saturday, September 27th at Shea, Sta- Shea Stadium in Brooklyn, New York. Shea Stadium, Jeff? Yeah, they, uh, they, they picked it up. Put it on the back of a truck. <laughs> and they moved Bro- it over to Brooklyn? Is yeah. this true, uh, Billy? Have you heard about this? It's in my backyard right now, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Good for you. And good luck with that, Jeff. I heard the Beatles played there. Yeah, and the Ruddles. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Max Cook has a new blog. It's maxcookuncorked.com. Check that out. And also check out Max and Adam's Bowler Hat Productions. And their Mimosa podcast show, Max Cook and the Counselor.com. That's where you can check that out. And Dave Pace, every, this is all exciting stuff here, Joe. Dave Pace. <laughs> Dave Pace is back. Is now almost <laughs> is now a contributing writer at Rue Morgue magazine. Look for his work over there. And you can check out his blog on horror me. This is, I, I didn't even know that this was a subject. Horror Media Politics. Okay, at La Politique Psychotronique. Which you can find at psychotronic.com. Sorry, Dave. I really love what you're doing. I really do. Music from the cutting room is done by the Zillatones. Check them out at www.thezillatones.com or search for the Zillatones at reverbnation.com. Jesus, Joe, this is taking me Our forever. Pl- <laughs> Our plugs are like the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> yeah, <at this> point. <laughs> God. Everybody went crazy. We'll be, we'll be back next week, man. We're going to continue with Weirdo Alien Films. We've got The Man Who Fell to Earth. Jeff is going to introduce that. And we also have The Brother from Another Planet, directed by John Sales. I'm going to introduce that. Until then, we're over and we're out. Ciao. Ask Laser has accomplished. First, he's removed nearly all plot. On first viewing of the film, it's what bothered me most, that nothing really happens. Scarlett Johansson's alien visitor wanders around Scotland, enticing lone men into her van, taking them to meet a horrible fate, but finally develops some sort of conscience and meets her own kind of fate. You can read more about the story online, or read Michael Faber's book of the same name, which I haven't, but I think this will only devalue your experience of watching the film. To discuss it in the usual language of plot points, etc., or to think of it as some familiar parable, in short, to explain it, is trivializing. 
The second thing Glazer has done is shoot in a persistently observant style, at times from cameras hidden in public, and of course the famous scenes of Scarlett Johansson interacting with non-actors who was without mirroring his provocateur's instincts. But hold on. Wait 24 hours. You might be washing dishes or walking to the car when you find yourself replaying images from the film. You might hear its sounds and remember its moods, its moments. Because this film, as much as any I've seen in the past year, is a living thing to itself. Crafted and sculpted and cared for and reared by its director as only a loving parent could. Here is a film that wants to be alive and possess a singular identity. And if it mimics the behaviors of those films which are kindred spirits, so too children mimic their peers. Glazer has, with all his might, tried to make a film which is a vehicle of transformation. To analyze further is to make a physiological catalog of the parts of a horse without loving the beauty of the beast at full gallop. But at the risk of doing so, I'll point out two things. While Hollywood showers us in a shitstorm of pizzazz, filmmakers like Steve McQueen and Nicholas Reffin and Gaspar Noé and P.T. Anderson have taken a long step back from the audience and hoisted a middle finger, retreating into a stark and stubborn minimalism that demands you get off your ass and meet it halfway. Their toolkit is less, not more. In an age where you can sit in the multiplex and hear Transformers hammering the Taurus traps three theaters away, these cats have decided to shut their mouths, cross their arms, and use silence as a weapon. The static camera and the long take are their defenses. They will beat you in a staring contest. Now take under the skin, Jonathan Glazer's polarizing alien visitor yarn. On the surface, it's a smooth, facile piece of work without much plot, and owes too much to Stanley Kubrick's visual obsession of 2014. The box office collapsed. I wasn't the only one avoiding the cinema. No one went to see any of the superhero dreck except Guardians of the Galaxy. Why? Because the rabble is bored. We'll now have the spectacle of financially imploding studios grasping for life preservers as the wreckage sinks beneath their feet. Maybe in the ensuing chaos there will be a few more chances taken on ideas, not budgets. And film, this beautiful shitty art, will have a little room to stretch its legs. The problem, as a market-driven art, has always been us. We, the audience, are the other half of her equation and we have shitty taste. We forced her to live in the shadows like a guerrilla fighter, picking her battles carefully, but despite our best efforts, she's still got fight in her, a lot, and she's tired of our bullshit. This summer, I walked away from the films. I didn't want to see another damn movie so long as I lived. I headed for the hills, for salt water and forests and books and anything but a damn movie. I was tired of it. Tired of the ads and posters and the same old plots, and the same old cuts, and the same old actors. Most of all, I was tired of knowing everything they had to say. Pauline Kael said, other arts show an internal logic in their development, the constant solving of aesthetic challenges. Films have changed simply by following the logic of the market. Or as paraphrased by Andrei Tarkovsky, the cinema she is a whore. Then again, in a tough world, sometimes being a whore is the only way to survive. Take the summer.